this first. Yes, it works. So yes, I work at Orange and um, Orange in France, and it's um, it's uh, a, a rare privilege to work for a really big organization. You have lots of constraints, lots of unhappy moments, but you also have. Uh, real complexity, <laughs> and that's something that we actually revel in no matter what we say. <laughs> Life wouldn't be as interesting. But I'll start with a little something about uh, my unusual journey, and not too long ago I realized that, um, so, yeah, not too long ago I realized that, in fact, I don't know if many people can say that, but I was actually raised inside an organization, which, uh, is a, is a bold statement, but um, my father was a hotel manager, a very large hotel manager, and all our lives, uh, as a child, I lived inside of the hotel, among the clients. And um, this is, uh, you know, watching the guests come in, come out, watching everybody interacting with them, uh, day in, day out, and I could see that my father had only one motto, um, and it would be, and I'll say it because he had a very heavy French accent, the client is king. Which, compared to everybody else in France at the time, was somewhat unusual. You only had this attitude in the, luxur in the luxury business because uh, most of the time in France, like, people were actually, um, they were not offering a service but you, you should be honored that they were dealing with you. <laughs> that was the, the traditional stance. And, you know, I saw people uh, in the hotel that would actually uh, um, go through um, people who would actually uh, greet them, take care of their cars, take care of their luggage, uh, people who would take care of their rooms, who would take care of them at night, people who would take care of them um, at the spa and the hairdressers, at the restaurant, at the bar. All of these units of people working seamlessly behind to offer the best possible service to people. They even had, I knew long before it was uh, adopted by the, by the industry, what a concierge was. <laughs> That's one of the ways my father learned his trade because he never went to school. He did everything. He went from being a busboy to working in the kitchen, of a, then being a maitre d'eau, then being a concierge. And so he worked all the ranks up. And he had this very um, human touch to it, like I'm part of this organic structure that I have to um, organize. And not this type of structure that you would find today if you look for the structure of a hotel, which is a bit extremely hierarchical and not very interesting way of dealing with things. We already had a very strong client perspective. And to give you an idea of what a client perspective is, is that we had people, we had your traditional tourists that were there for, let's say, a very short time. Then you would have performers, Leonard Cohen, um, all sorts of performers, rock stars, jazz musicians, um, would stay while they're on tour, so that was also transitory. But we had people that stayed a little longer, even on a, even on a recurring base, so we had actors, directors, Orson Welles would stay for quite a while, Godard would come every year for a while, spend the season. Um, and then you had something that is not even known anymore, is we had people who lived there year long. And these considered the hotel as their home. So it was very strange because you would navigate needs that were very different. And um, the whole personnel, everybody was actually out there to help people out and figure out, even anticipate the needs that would be completely different from the people who would stay there all year long from those, of course, who were just, you know, strangers passing by. So that gives you a little story on how uh, I was very much into systems. And the other things that, that struck me is that when I was about 10 years old, I saw this wonderful documentary. There was this German man who was talking about the things that he was designing for Brown. 
and he was saying that he was making things for everybody, that objects had to be democratic and they had to be available, accessible to everybody, and they had to be good and they had to be beautiful. And later on, I realized that it was Dieter Rams, but I didn't know at the time, I was 10, and I looked at my mother and I said, hmm, that's a good direction, I'd like to do something like that. <laughs> so, you know, it, you, sometimes you find out that you do that, just that in life. Well, now I'm in a big organization, and I'm in a, the French part of Orange, and I work in a division that's called Entertainment and New Territories. Actually, it's called New Usage, but doesn't translate very well to, uh, to English, so I sort of put it to, to New Territories. So I have the extreme advantage to have people around me, marketing and techno technology teams, that actually deal with TV services, uh, web services, entertainment, media as well, connected services, like as in IoT or ecosystems like that. We've just acquired a bank, so we now have payment and banking systems and services, and we also have advertising services. Though this is probably not the favorite part of designers. <laughs> and all these services actually uh, function on several different platforms. I hadn't even started to add the new platforms that IOTs are going to bring because we're not even there yet. But we operate on a TV platform, which is a special operating system, and we have several versions of it, and it's quite complicated. It's a long process to actually, you know, sort of homogenize uh, what people have. And um, we have web platforms in all sizes. Um, and to give you an idea, every other person in France is a client of Orange at some point. And for the web platform, we have over tw 20 million users. So basically, when something goes online, you're pretty sure that 20 minutes later, you know what's, <laughs> what's happening, because it's like 4 million users every day. So it's like enormous. Uh, the counterpart of it is, of course, when you have such power, is that it makes everybody um, very antsy, and um, decision making is a terrible, terribly difficult process. And considering that the telco market is a very tense one, especially because there's a there's a fourth actor in in French market that makes everybody extremely tense. So. Um, decision making is uh, a difficult thing. And then we have the world of applications. And um, this also, um, we have those services, some of the services actually go all the way through all the platforms, not all our services at the moment, but quite a few. So um, my the, the design team that I'm part of, um, actually has to, originally we were devoted to web platforms, and um, for the past eight years I had more of a transversal role because I supported other, uh, other teams outside the division that were dealing with identity, with um, access, as in Wi-Fi access, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a um, sort of experience in the team of you know, trying to learn quickly uh, a variety of services. And then we also have this idea that by and by, step by step, we learn more about different platforms and their constraints, which sometimes you have to learn quite quickly. So there comes along a nice project that ends up in my lap, which is a transversal search project. And the transversal search project I'm um, an IA by trade, and among other things. So I said, ah, search, wonderful. So that's going to be, you know, and then here I go with my traditional approach, the Marvel type, so, you know, people, context, content, as in uh, content types of documents and objects and the existing structure, people, who our targets are, what do they need, um, how do they behave when they're actually searching something. And, um, of course, context is our, what are our business objectives and uh, what is the business model, revenue, what's the culture. And when you do that from a transversal point of view, 
man becomes, um, hmm, it start, complexity rises at another level because we're dealing with entertainment search, a transver transversal entertainment means we're dealing with live TV, we're dealing with replay, we're dealing with video on demand, that's already quite complicated, then we add games, then we add music, and potentially uh, publications as well. So all of that in terms of IA is already um, rather complicated. And you, you realize that, you know, I remember taking a workshop with uh, Milan last year. I thought, oh, then maybe uh, I need to move on to the, uh, also to the enterprise side of it because I don't know how I'm going to deal with all the things that I have to take into account, right? So uh, uh, here's the model. And um, how was I going to get into it? Was I going to dive through the big picture, through the frames, through the anatomy, the design space? My company is extremely siloed. So when I showed earlier on that we had these various divisions, this was a result of a, of a regrouping of services about two years ago where all the TV services were regrouped with all the other services. They happened to have lived their lives for a long time on their own, so now they were put back into the same division. And this meant that we still had a lot of, um, you know, you can think of silos when you think of the, the shop versus the support versus the TV. But even within the entertainment or the new usage, it's already a microcosm of long dating silos. And we have to make that all porous. And, um, and it's not that people misbehave, it's just that, um, you know, big companies are monsters. And, and they all start to behave like the monster they're in, you know? It's, so it's, you have to counteract that. And I thought, my God, you know, this reminds me every time I mention um, this, you know, are we going to be bricks? Are we going to be bricks and mortar? Are we going to be just mortar? This is a <laughs> The bricks are the specialists and they, that's what they do. And they're very, you know, uh, coherent in what they do. And then you have the mortar people who have actually the knowledge of everything else, but what they do is facilitate and, and glue everything together. And um, as designers, you know, where, where we're going to stop, are we, where we're going to be, you know, bricks or mortar, or both facilitators. And communication, of course, was a big, uh, a big thing, so I couldn't help but remember cautionary tale of Conway's um, so that, you know, organization which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. That's what he wrote in 1968. And uh, this, is, this is his original drawing in the way that he sent it to the Harvard uh, Business Review, who incidentally rejected his paper based on the fact that he hadn't proved his hypothesis. <laughs> Later on, they went on to do the experiment to prove it, <laughs> which uh, I think uh, is interesting. But it, it sounds like a tautology, but it's a reality when you're in the middle of it. You know, you're every day you're reminded that the, the channels and the structure of communication will dictate the, the, the final result, <laughs> no matter what. And. Uh, which is why I think it's, it's interesting when, you, when you're able to introduce smaller units inside of bigger units and, and you can achieve this kind of, of nimbleness that makes for straight communication inside of a more complex, foggy system. And if you can you know, put that in place, either it's you know, small prototypes or it's small proof of concept by a, you know, an external consultant that comes for a while and works in. But um, this is what we uh, actually need. So then I thought, OK, so how did, this, how did this happen to come into our lap? Unusual. It was unusual because it was, in fact, the, uh, the tech people, and this happens 
this is not the first time I encounter that at Orange. We've had that before when the iPhone came out. We had the, the dev team come up, had an innovation challenge, and they said, we can do that. Are you interested? So in this case, um, the, some of the uh, interactive developing teams had worked on an in innovation challenge, an open challenge, and they could actually build a search for TV that would be an interactive web service plugged into the TV, and which made a big difference because, for most of you, you may not know, but um, usually search is part of the, of the, the resident OS, the resident application of the boxes that distribute TV, and they're very hard to evolve, they're very long, and um, in our case, it always fell to the bottom, so the, the search on TV is very bad. So this idea was, ha, huh, wonderful, let's, uh, let's, have, let's, ha let's try this, this could be interesting. Um, it also meant for a different kind of uh, a different kind of challenge because um, so the, the TV part, the traditional TV is like plan, you know, your traditional waterfall, plan everything ahead. Uh, try to, at least. Half of the time you realize down the line that you haven't planned for everything ahead, so you, you lose some time. You do some a priori testing that this is going to go the right way, but you're not sure. And then you spend, you spend an enormous, inordinate amount of time on presentation and communication. And you actually polish, you do a lot of visualization of what you're, you're selling because there is no way to actually prototype it in a, in a reasonable manner. And then you send to production. And this, you know, and then you wait until this comes out. And for once, we could actually, um, implement something else which was very agile because the type of web the, the type of search that we were working with um, allowed us to have three week cycles Can you imagine plunging a three week cycle unit to a big thing that goes <laughs> 18 months so there's a sort of rapport and immediately there's a lot of uh, distrust between teams of course hmm? they, they don't work the same way and they don't have the same vocabulary for sure and um, of course the stakeholders no matter how many times you tell them that this is agile they have the same response which is they have to be guarded they have to plan everything ahead they have to see umpteen versions of it you know because because that's what they're used to and when you tell them it doesn't matter, you know, if we're not happy with it, within three weeks we'll change something. Don't worry, I mean, you know, it's not, it's not the end of the, uh, of, the, of the day. And this took a lot of, a lot of conversations. And um, from the business point of view, now, of course we knew that there were the, the, the we knew that we couldn't answer properly. We knew that the catalog wasn't very well labeled, so there was a big effort on controlled vocabulary, on, on merging all the various um, databases, um, which is a, hu a huge, huge amount of work because you, you're mer merging different, co totally different um, ecosystems between live TV. Replay, which is another whole ball game with its rights management, which is totally different. Uh, and of course, every channel would like to actually handle their own replay rather than have the third party like Orange do the job. Uh, and from a business point of view, when we talk with the business owners, of course, every time this is something that comes up when you're trying to actually acknowledge their constraints and at the same time make it so that they can let go and potentially try something else. But this is the, the hard part. It takes a lot of conversation. I had not planned, I don't know that I'm naive, but I had never, never planned that many discussions. I think I've had, I've had like six present whole presentation once a month to actually get the project going and to be somewhat understood. 
and this is enormous, <laughs> and I haven't finished. I'm afraid I can't show it to you because it's still not live for the moment. It shouldn't, should be this fall, so I haven't had agreement to show the, the project yet. But, um, I mean, it's been publicly endorsed by the CEO of Orange, and he's made presentations about it. But, um, but internally, what it meant was, um, you know, how do we deal, how are we going to navigate First of all, vocabulary is that we don't know as designers. I'm not a structure or specialist. That's, that's, not, my <laughs> that's not my thing, right? Um, I can understand where somebody comes from because I'm going to ask the questions that are necessary. Uh, I'm not quite sure I can understand how content negotiations are made, but I'm going to have to deal with it. Uh, and uh, I'm, I have these difficult, very difficult conversations with stakeholders about what exactly are they measuring. <laughs> A lot of them, for, for one thing, you have to remember that um, there is this sort of culture of, um, how would you say? Hmm incomplete follow-up on numbers. That is, yes, but I mean, it's only natural. It's like in the report, you will say, for example, that we have 10% of our clients will end up with a, no, a complete no result because the content does not exist in our data database. Right? So when I say incomplete is that there's not a question if there is something else we can actually measure after that. So it's just, okay, you make a search, this is the result. Now, on the other hand, the company wants to boost sales, wants to boost usage, but there is, at this moment, there's this rupture. What, what's the next step when you have a, a zero response, for example? Or is there anything we can do? Is it something due to our database? Or um, is it something due to the fact that, unfortunately, our client doesn't care, but um, the content is not available on his mobile, but is available on his TV. Hmm, how do you explain that? You know, it's like, so this is something that, that we have hard discussions about, and it, it's, um, I've, if I've learned one thing, is that you, you become extremely pragmatic about the types of data you are going to follow and you are going to request when uh, on each platform. And we, of course, didn't have that much time to do um, research. Uh, what we ended up is, you know, month after month, a lot of uh, conversations with a lot of opinions. Um, and at some point, you feel like you're, you're lost in the sea of opinions. And you think, oh, I'll never get off it. It's not going to work. And then you think, OK. Well, you know, let's be, let's be agile. Let's wait until we get to the next cycle, right? <laughs> Maybe somebody will have heard something in what we've, uh, in what we've tried to achieve. And um, then the question became for me meaningfulness. How can, I, can we communicate meaningfulness? Because from a business point of view, there is always this disconnect about what experience is, right? Um, I'd like to read that little, that short passage that um, was at the, clo the, the closing of the plenary by Jesse James Garrett at the IA Summit this year. And um, when, um, when he talks about um, use and experience, use means that the value of the experience is not the experience itself which um, we have to think about it. Hmm? It's what in the experience helps us to accomplish. So when we use something, the experience we have using it is not actually the reason why we engage with it. The value of the experience is extrinsic to the experience. <laughs> You'll have to appropriate it. It's a concept, but... Um, 
I mean, of course, as human beings, as he says, we, we create a lot of things where the, where the experience is the value. For example, in, our, in art and music, for example, the experience is the value, but not in the kinds of things that we're dealing with. Okay? And even though, you know, people might want to uh, watch TV, it's a form of experience, but it's, it's not, uh, I would say, that idea that um, the value that people derive from it is in their lives and not in the actual experience that they have during the, f the, the fact that they watch a movie on TV. And I have to, in communicating that lens to, you know, what is meaningful uh, for people in, in, um, in my exchange with, um, with the business people in particular, but sometimes with the dev people as well, which is I have to bring them back to what the context of use is. And when you, when you deal with TV, with um, web and um, applications all together, sometimes you even have two of the channels together. More and more we see people in front of the TV that actually um, you know, does something on the tablet or uh, on their mobile. Sometimes they're actually even searching on both. And because there is a fundamental <laughs> dynamic that we overlook where TV is concerned. TV is not a personal experience. TV is not a one-to-one -one experience. TV is a social experience. It is the experience of whoever is in the room with the TV. So um, often, you know, unless you live, you, you live a solitary life, um, but more often than not, it's a question of who is in the room. So it can be you know, the spouse, but it can be your family, it can be friends, and it becomes, um, it becomes a, um, a really interesting game because you have who's got, who's in the pecking order, who's got the, the remote, for one thing, and then who shouts fastest, right? So that when you're dealing with, with search, we noticed that all the search requests in the, on TV were extremely precise. And it was this phenomenon that we were actually seeing, which is because people talk to each other in the room and they emulate and they get to really, oh, let's see if they have this film or what do they have with this actor. But mainly, they go to extreme lengths with the remote, which is very uncomfortable, uh, a, a terrible input. But you should see people input sometimes like 15 letters and you go, Wow, <laughs> you don't know how they did that, you know? And so we have to, to explain where it comes from and the co you know, the how, what the corollary of that is, which is everybody's watching the screen, they know what it is, they know the name, and they know where it ends because they know the name, okay? So the game becomes how can you put fast forward the fastest possible way the, uh, the proper answer. It doesn't matter if you offer other answers. It, it's, it doesn't matter, really, because it's so precise. And as Jerry showed yesterday in his workshop, it's, it's gone so far that when, when you on, on the web, when you start typing weather in Google, um, it's already in the autocomplete. The weather, your local weather is already there in the autocomplete. Well, it's the same thing on, on, on the TV, except it, it, that it's not a web inquiry and, and it's going to be something about something you can watch or listen to uh, on, the, on the TV. When I say listen to, oddly enough, we have a lot of people who actually um, listen to music on TV because it's their best sound system in the house. So it's sort of, you know, you have to uncover all assumptions and understanding of all those things to be able to um, work out with um, what the meaningfulness of this is for people. And of course, we always have to communicate with strong, robust metrics to be able to counter some of the arguments. So. After that, I changed the lenses and I thought, okay, well, how can we communicate experience, right? How are we going to show people, you know, the axis where we want to, you know, go over to empathy and, and create some emotional innovation? Like if everybody's in the room and they find immediately, oh, wow, they have this movie, wonderful. 
And it's not on Netflix, but it's on something else, whatever. We, still, we will have answers. Again, there's silos with your partners. <laughs> right now, we, we don't have the, we, we're not allowed to answer on the catalog of, of Netflix. So. But, um, and uh, on the other hand, what can we actually, uh, in terms of, of creativity, how much can we um, put forward in terms of behavioral innovation? In the decision making, for example, because this is killing us, you know, all these committees, and how are we going to change this conversation? So what we started to do is, you know, look at you know, what is a conversation. So we put together a number of activities to have everybody, um, all the teams, all together, the, the design teams, the marketing teams, and the dev teams, as much as we could. Some of our dev teams, unfortunately, are in the south of France, so it's kind of difficult to have them come in and, and play, but some of them are uh, in the Paris area. And um, we start looking at the vocabulary. So there's some techniques from IEA that have proven to be quite interesting. Sort of, we're adapting the tools. We're taking, for example, the way domain-driven um, modeling, domain modeling is put together. So it's an activity where everybody will start with a word and they will complete all the directions, all the other words associated uh, around it, and then you know, you sort them out and you figure out what are the semantic relationships between all the words that you've actually sorted out. So this is a group activity which helps, and, and it's a form of alignment that was really helpful for us because we, we didn't have to hold the position of telling them this is not the right word. They came to an agreement to what the useful words were as opposed to coming from this area where somebody said A, and A was like this for the other person. So um, you can imagine after, you know how it is, it, it becomes a contest, who is right and who is wrong in the room, um, rapidly when you put different <laughs> directions in the same room, this happens. So domain modeling was the first tool that we used and it proved to be really beneficial because just this simple activity got everybody on par for using the same words. If, if you have any questions, go ahead, because I'm not quite sure if everybody's familiar with all those notions. Um, and figuring out what the relationship between words are was also quite interesting. It took a while. Then we, took, we did a, another series of um, exercises where we, were, we would align people along dimensions. So for example, we would um, have a dimension that would go from, uh, is it a, a question of um, acquiring new customers or is it a question of offering a better service? So that in the continuum, people would vote. And as they would vote, they would naturally align themselves onto, okay, now we know why we are more service-oriented. Rather than saying, oh, well, yeah, but you know, it's Paul, and Paul, he's all for acquiring new customers, but we don't think so. So this whole idea is trying to find ways to build, to bridge that conversation between two people who think very differently, and of course, then multiplied by the number of teams who are there. So the dimensions was a very good exercise because it, it allowed everybody to position themselves and in, it allowed us to also, we, we didn't have to argue for the fact that um, the, the solution that, that everybody came up with, you know, the, the first answer should be what is immediately available now for free. It's not an obvious choice when you're selling video on demand, but as long as you go along the agreement of those dimensions, you end up going in the direction of the user because you're not thinking in terms of your own outcomes, you're just trying to understand where you sit on the kind of scales for the services that you're offering. Of course, if nothing free is available right now, 
anything that you can pay for that is available right now will be presented. If the thing is only available for free, but later that's presented. At a, so what we happen to agree on is we could factor the answers and not push the various silos. We could just say, OK, it's either a movie, it's a broad broadcast program, it's a TV series, it's a music, it's a game. Behind that, who cares? And what you want to what you want to show to the customer is the availability. Can he really? Can she or he? Can they uh, actually have it right now or not? That was that was the the idea. And this would not have been possible with and without these methods. So. Then we thought about, you know, how can we also innovate in terms of um, the activities that we're doing? Because obviously in, in the TV area, things were a lot about presentation, a lot about showing screens, and having this um, slightly prof prof professoral attitude, like, um, you know, we're experts, we're designers, and we're going to show you it works like that. Okay. But then we had the chance with this prototype um, of TV, because it was a, as an interactive service, we had a live prototype on TV, which is extremely rare these days, unless you're working with, with applications and, and stuff you can find in, in iTunes. So the idea was to actually start testing the prototype with people with people and stakeholders. Everybody did the test, OK? And then the idea was, OK, so how can we invent something? How can we use something, derive new tools that will help us move from ergonomic metrics, which are very quantitative met metrics, and these are not very probable metrics. They're like predictable metrics, but they're not probable. And we want to move into the meaningfulness, what the meaningfulness of the experience is. It's, it's a hypothesis and it's probable. How we do we move from, from um, uh, numbers to words? That was, um, that was kind of um, a moment for, for the team, which was, OK, is there a test that allows us to actually get at this feeling that what we're offering actually s is satisfying, is easy to use, is fast, and um, uh, comfortable, and potentially, I say potentially because it's not the finished product, um, is it possible to test all that? So we had a small prototype, and the prototype was half fake. So this was the beginning of a new conversation. Because in the realm of hard numbers, and predictability, you want a finished prototype. You don't want something that's half, we, we used to call it half cardboard, because it was just, you know, sometimes some of the services were not plugged, so we emulated fake responses, right? So the initial, the initial conversation was, oh, how can you trust a prototype like that? So there was devising, uh, devising tests that could actually allow for a comprehension of what was happening and not allow for a comprehension of performance, which is a whole other debate. And um, we used um, um, a method that's called ACTS, Anticipated Experience um, Evaluation. And again, it's based on a continuum. You may have heard of it. It, it was originally uh, put together to be able to quantify, or to actually not quantify, but to measure semantically uh, what happens when you um, offer a future scenario to uh, people to test. And you want to see if they understand a future scenario. Is it probably something you'll like or not? Is it probably something you'll use or not? And the idea, again, you're using continuums, but this time you're using continuums between two, um, a series of two pictures, of pairs of pictures. And both pairs, um, the pairs indicate a continuum between two to three possible axes. 
For example, I'll give you an example. There's a, uh, on the left, there's a, a fast train, a metro train from um, Tokyo, and on the right, there is um, a snail. So you let the person, what you do is you let the person do the test, and then you say, well, based on what you've just done, um, tell me where you would put yourself, you know, between those two pictures and why. So they tell you what axis they choose, which is really interesting because some of them will, will, will talk about speed, uh, but some people will talk about is it something that's extremely technical, mechanical versus something that's extremely biological. And they choose and they tell you why. And then what you do is, you'll, you'll see in the end, but you make some sort of radar so you can see the progression of one version versus another version. We tested actually, we have three versions. Two are being tested right now. We did, we did two previous to choose two uh, methods. And um, so that was really interesting because when the stakeholders, it, it's not new, but when they take the test and they do their own evaluation, their comprehension of the empathy part becomes obvious, which allows us to really innovate in terms of what we can do in terms of behavior and how we can have the whole group of stakeholders come together. Furthermore, some people go and tell others, oh, I did the test, you should, it's great. Um, we had a major champion um, who actually came out of the test and said, this is the way we should work all time, always. So I thought, ah, we've made a little progress from before. <laughs> but it wasn't obvious in the beginning. And we make maps. So why do we make maps? And this is part of my earliest studies that are, that's going to kick in right now. It's because our brain is wired for that. We have a region in the, in the brain that's called the hippocampus. Um, this is the brain of a rat, but it's the same here for you. It's, it's globally above your ears here, underneath the cortex. And we've known for many years that the hippocamp without a hippocampus, by accident, by birth defect, or because you've drank too much in your life, whatever the reasons, when it's not there, you cannot memorize and you cannot um, orient yourself in space. These are two things that this area does, which is calculate where you are in space and time. We also know as a result that most of the people that have defects in this region also cannot imagine. They have strong defects in imagination. So what is really interesting is that more recently, these were, were discovered in the 70s, but more recently, and there was a Nobel Prize in 2014, but the, the, the work comes from 2005, from Norwegian researchers, is that in the entorhinal cortex next to it, you have this, this incredible mesh of uh, neurons that are like an interactive carpet that works on its own. That is, you know, your brain is inside, is closed inside your, your skull. It's never in contact with the outside. And no matter what step you take and what direction, there is a single neuron that will fire, and everything else around it is wired in such a way that if you do move, then it, wire, it starts firing too. So you get, a, you, you get a sense of your deambulation, you know, how you're going about things. Even more so, um, it also is quite important next to it, there's also a series of little cells that allow to tell you, oh, but your head was down, and it was tilted to the left. So you can actually see your perspective on the, ma on the journey you took. And so, why am I telling you that? Because this is the way we do, we think and we do in reality. We sort of have this thing about integrated path or dead reckoning. Okay, you, we start somewhere, and then we know you, we've gone a leg of a journey, la la la, and then somehow our hippocampus does all this magical work. He says, you have done this journey, right? This orange journey. This is, what you've, this is what you've done. And we do the exact same thing with meaning, which is why all those mappings are so important for us, because when we construct together the mapping, we have the same dead reckoning. The whole team has the same way of thinking, 
and um, any error accumulated during the journey, because you, I mean, navigators used to do that on the sea. They had a fixed, a fixed element being the, the stars, but the rest during the day, there weren't any stars, so they had this sort of dead reckoning. And you can accumulate some error if during the, during the journey, you're not very precise in recording what you've done. So, of course, this happens to teams also when they navigate a project. It's exactly the same thing. We get totally lost in the project. Who agreed to what, for what reason? And then we tango back to another decision, and then we take a sidestep because somebody comes in, and I'm sure you've all been through projects like that. And there's nothing worse than not knowing where you are at in the project. So the more cartography we can do together, uh, the better we're off. Because otherwise, everybody's got to, oh, we should go this way, we should go this way, we should go this way, right? So mapping was also an important thing for us. We used two types of mapping. We used the um, project canvas model of that was adapted by Jim Kalbach that actually stated all the steps and the strategy that we were going to put uh, as a team for, for UX available for everybody. And we mapped journeys, experiences, you know, just traditional cartography. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Um, you know, I like this kind of representation because that way it's in between the domain modeling and, and, and the cognitive map. And I get to explain to, to the teams, you know, how we ponder things, you know. Is it going to cost us? Uh, um, uh, who's going to influence us? Who's going to actually bump us up? Et cetera, et cetera. Because that's the natural way of understanding a project. Otherwise, um, we all have our partial view, and we never come together, in the, especially if we're not all together. So keeping the mental map was really important. And then the last thing, and I'm actually, y y you, you'll, you'll be familiar with it, because I saw um, a presentation by one of your colleagues in Paris on the IBM uh, representation being that, you know, right now it's investing in people, places, and practices, and um, which is exactly the types of challenges that we're facing. Um, and for me, the sort of, you know, are we going from swiftness to cohesion? We need both. The, ac the tension is on both ends. We need to be swift and we need to be cohesive. And at the same time, um, we need to have more people on board uh, that, uh, that share the same practices so there's more fluidity for us in terms of, of activities. Um, and so trying to get all the design people um, to share openly their practices, why, and make a, um, a, common, um, a common repository and uh, not just style guides or principles, we have principles. And this is not enough for, for the design teams that are actually, we have the systems that we're more embedded, we're little embedded teams, and, but we don't have this central gathering from time to time that would realign us. And then, of course, places, because those people in places will give us a lot of creativity. So, to give you a small example of, uh, this is in French, but you won't mind. Um, the kinds of radar that we get from these is that we can actually even test how people are assessing the process, how do they feel on it, and just showing that is enough. We don't need to go into hard facts. People know where we're going, you know? People have a s direction, okay, we're getting, we're getting swifter, it's definitely simpler, uh, we're relaxed, okay? The new version of our work is more relaxed, it's more human, um, just about as clean, just about as predictable, a little clearer for everybody. And every time we, we gain a point, it's easier for us to keep on pushing um, people to share um, the practices and align them together. So this is, you know, the type of works we're doing. And we try to go with the flow. <laughs> 
<laughs> which is a bumpy ride at times. Thank you.